All right, thank you. Um, and this is a, that's a good sort of compliment for what we're going to talk about now. As Dr. Raisner had alluded, had actually nicely illustrated, there are some limitations of coronary angiography. And in 2016, we have alternative modalities to interpret coronary atherosclerosis in the cath lab. And as we go through them, you'll see some of the data has become more and more powerful in utilizing these um, different devices and, and techniques. So we'll go through FFR, which is the uh, physiologic assessment, as well as IVIS and some OCT, which is the anatomical assessment, looking at the background of these uh, different modalities, the basic principles, review some simple images so you just get familiar with them, and then show uh, the clinical data, which is fairly strong for FFR and more limited with IVIS and OCT. So, um, as Dr. Raisner had showed, there are limitations of angiography in that it's a two-dimensional luminogram. So these, these two lesions here are actually, the, if I can get the mouse, oh, is it A? Yeah, I got it. Uh, this is the same lesion, just being imaged in two different projections. And you can see in one projection it appears more significant, maybe 75%, whereas in another projection it doesn't appear as significant, maybe a mild lesion at 25%. So the trick is how do you determine what is the clinical significance of this lesion and the physiologic significance. Furthermore, angiography cannot identify intraluminal detail and give you any idea of the pathology. And it has a difficult time distinguishing diffuse disease from normal in that if you have a completely diffusely diseased LAD, it can look completely normal angiography, angiographically and you could be fooled in that it is a uh, significantly diseased vessel. So this all came about, this um, sort of 70% lesion, which is sort of the uh, cutoff and distinction between significant and less significant. In 1974, right here in Houston, Texas, this is Lance Gould's work um, in a dog lab. And what you can see, and what he did, was he took uh, LEDs in a dog model and could barely sort of precisely ratchet up the degree of stenosis. And looking at both resting hemodynamics and coronary flow reserve in blue. When you look at the resting hemodynamics as he increased the degree of narrowing, the flow was not really impaired until the uh, stenosis was about 85%. When you look at coronary flow reserve, which we'll get into in a little bit more detail of what that is when we review FFR, but generally a normal coronary artery can increase its flow anywhere from three to fourfold in the setting of exercise or some drug-induced hyperemic state. So here you see the coronary flow reserve actually becomes uh, impaired at about 50%. So putting these two together, um, a little bit uh, discordant, although different physiologic states, an agreed upon sort of number in the cath lab has been 70% stenosis. Uh, determines what would be clinically significant. This is also work uh, from Dr. Gould showing the R limitation of uh, determining physiologic significance based on luminograms or angiograms. So these are artificial angiograms in uh, tubes where he created very precise, accurate degrees of stenosis. So going from top to bottom, what do you think the degree of stenosis is in this top lesion? You think it's 25, 50, 75, 100. So this is normal. This is the blockage, and this is the distal one. Anyone just throw out a guess? 25. So you guys are getting pretty good. 33. How about this one? Close. Yeah, someone said 50. 60 is close. Now, this is, how about this one? This is the, so the, the less disease arteries are pretty easy, right? But what about this one? How many? 80, 90? 67. So it doesn't even meet that 70% criteria. So it, 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 and I think we would all in, an, in the cath lab see something like this and start panicking. There'd probably be a stent in there, but really it may not actually be that significant. How about this bottom one that's actually almost, there's almost no flow. So what do you think? 83. So you can see our, our eyes do a very, and you guys did a great job on the, on the less severe arteries, but when it gets severe, we have a tough time. I mean, we all want to overestimate things a little bit, and, and, it's, and it's a challenge. 
but that's where things like FFR and OCT can come in to help better define um, how significant the lesion is. We'll get into this a little bit more, um, but this is fame and this is courage. So fame just realized that uh, it showed a significant benefit as far as uh, survival from uh, major aspirous cardiac events when um, PCI was performed in an FFR guided manner, meaning only the lesions that were significant by FFR were treated compared to angiographically guided uh, treated vessels. It's also important to remember that for the most part, um, stable coronary artery disease is a, is a medical disease. It's medical management um, and PCI or surgery is indicated if patients are refractory to medical management uh, and it's really done for symptoms. So how do we help sort of overcome some of these limitations of angiography? And FFR, I think, is the modality from um, a physiologic standpoint that is the most powerful and now um, validated. So FFR is performed during an invasive angiogram, and it measures coronary physiology and provides objective evidence of how significant the lesion is. It's validated and reproducible, and it actually is a representative of the relative coronary flow reserve that's derived from pressure measurements, which I'll show you, in the aorta or proximal and then distal to the localized coronary stenosis at maximal pharmacologic arterial vasodilation or hyperemia. So adenosine is what we typically use. And it's especially useful in intermediate stenosis and uh, multivessel coronary artery disease. So here's a cartoon showing um, what we're assessing, and that's coronary flow reserve. So on the top, you have a normal artery, and on the bottom, you have a diseased artery. And in the graph here, you have the display of the coronary flow reserve. At rest, in the diseased artery and the normal artery, the coronary flow reserve is basal at one, normal. But when you exercise and you want to increase coronary flow, the normal artery is able to do that nicely. It increases flow threefold, whereas the diseased artery can only increase it to about 1.5 to 1.8 uh, fold. So this is the physiologic um, uh, issue that we're trying to figure out in the cath lab. Now, coronary flow is not the same thing as um, FFR. FFR are pressure measurements. So how do we get from uh, coronary flow to pressure? And the way we do that is by giving adenosine. By, I'm not going to go through it all, but it's Ohm's law. And if we give a adenosine or some sort of vasodilator and make all things equal downstream and equalize the resistance and the uh, coronary venous pressures, then all we need to compare are the uh, arterial pressures. So what we do in FFR Say this is a cartoon, a proximal LAD lesion that's 50%. You want to know what's the physiologic significance. You set up your catheter. You put in a FFR wire or, or catheter. There's catheters and wires now that can perform this. And it measures the pressure somewhere distal to the artery and then usually in the tip of the guiding catheter to give you a ratio. And that ratio um, can fall anywhere, obviously, from... I mean, if it's, if it's totally occluded, obviously, it's going to be very low, but anywhere from 0.5 to 0.99. These days, based on um, some clinical data that we'll look at in a second, 0.8 is, is determined sort of the cutoff for significance. Less than 0.8 would be someone who would benefit from some sort of mechanical revascularization, and greater than 0.8 is someone who can uh, defer mechanical revascularization. Now, that doesn't mean if you have an FFR of 0.82, that's a normal artery. I mean, that's, that's still a, a disease physiologic state, and ultimately, if they were failing medical therapy, you could still treat that patient. But from a starting point, you know that it's safe to defer them as far as both um, symptoms and um, uh, uh, cardiac outputs or uh, endpoints. So here are two examples looking at fairly similar angiograms but different clinical pictures and different physiologic um, responses to both lesions. This is a 54-year-old man who has stable coronary artery disease and had a uh, prox LED that was an angioplasty years ago versus a 48-year-old man who came in with sudden cardiac death. Both fairly, you know, not really significant looking and did an FFR on this and no surprise here, uh, not much change in the flows at maximal hyperemia with a value of 0.97. 
Whereas when you look at the, and, and investigate the patient, the man who had the sudden cardiac death, quite a different picture. During maximal hyperemia, you have quite a drop in flow distal to this lesion with an FFR value of 0.55. So clearly this one would warrant some sort of intervention where this one would um, be better off served with uh, medical therapy. One of the nice things about FFR versus on the right versus, uh, sorry, on the left versus coronary flow reserve uh, on the right is that it's independent of other hemodynamic conditions. So you can see here the FFR is um, done and then repeated at, in the same patient with different heart rates, different blood pressures, and different contractility uh, uh, parameters, and it really doesn't change at all. So completely independent of other hemodynamic um, uh, effects. Whereas coronary flow reserve, which we can measure with a Doppler wire in the coronary arteries, is much more sensitive to um, variations in, in hemodynamics. So it's, it's also now, just two or three weeks ago, uh, some of you may have seen, been validated in severe aortic stenosis. Because we see a lot of patients with aortic stenosis and coronary disease, and we're not sure how to treat them. And there's always been a question of doing FFR in these patients. But now, um, it wasn't a huge study, but, but fairly compelling. It showed similar uh, data to this and that it's very uh, reproducible. So in summary for FFR, just the highlights to remember, it's a flow index derived from hyperemic pressure. So it's, it's not a resting uh, uh, gradient. You have to give something to um, equalize the resistance. So some, usually adenosine is the drug. It can take into account collateral flows. It's useful in multivessel disease. It's stenosis specific. So you really are just interrogating that one lesion. A normal value is unequivocally one and a significant stenosis is less than or equal to 0.8 and it's independent from prevailing hemodynamics. The FAME study is probably the most um, powerful of the data that's provided for FFR-guided PCI, and, and there's data looking at graft patency, and now FAME 3 is going on, which is cabbage versus FFR-guided PCI. But here is the sort of take-home from FAME, and this is event-free survival out to one year comparing uh, 1,000 patients were randomized to FFR-guided therapy versus angiographically-guided therapy. And there was an absolute difference of uh, event-free survival of 5%. So that's pretty powerful for what we do in cardiology. That's a relative reduction of 30%. So um, really, I think, a valuable tool in the cath lab. I think, you know, it's myself included, it's relatively underutilized, but we're using more and more of it and uh, can be really helpful in distinguishing which lesions are physiologically significant. The anatomic um, evaluations include IVIS and OCT. So IVIS is a tomographic view that gives you better re resolution of the arterial wall with more accurate measurements and can be useful in ambiguous angiograms and can also help guide interventions. So here's the layout. When you do an IVIS, you'll get a cross-sectional view and a longitudinal view. And you can um, quantitate lesions one of two ways. One way is to do a uh, area of stenosis and compare it to a reference and come up with a percent stenosis, or get an absolute stenosis or a minimal luminal area in the proximal epicardial arteries or the left main, where in the proximal epicardial arteries, a minimal luminal area of less than four millimeters squared would be significant versus less than six millimeters squared in the left main. Here are a few examples. So here's your IVIS catheter. Here's your lumen. Here's your intima. The easiest thing to look for first is the media. That's this black circle. And then your adventitia. So when you start to look at a disease vessel, find the media first, because you know that's where the artery should be. And then here's the lumen. So all this is a very eccentric plaque inside of the artery. Here's a calcified lesion showing one of the um, shortcomings of uh, intravascular ultrasound in that you get some dropout beyond calcific lesions. And here's a stent where you can see the stent struts and some uh, uh, neointimal hyperplasia inside the stents. So OCT is a great uh, anatomic tool um, that provides a little bit better resolution, but you lose a little bit as far as depth penetration. So you can see really elegant pictures, the same setup with a cross-sectional and a longitudinal view. And one of the advantages is you don't get that dropout. So here's a calcific plaque, here is some lipid plaque, and here's fibrous plaque. 
And you can also get a better sense of some underlying uh, pathophysiology. You can f see ruptured, small ruptured plaques and thrombus that you wouldn't necessarily appreciate in an IVUS. Also, stent coverage is um, much better visualized, and when you start doing bioabsorbable stents, OCT will be um, really the best modality to interrogate those devices. So high resolution, easy to interpret, um, very limited, in fact, no clinical data as far as how to, hard outcomes, but, but a good uh, sort of ancillary. So in summary, given the limitations of angiography, having these additional techniques to evaluate uh, the coronary artery disease in the cath lab are essential. FFR defines physiology and determines whether or not a lesion should be revascularized or treated medically, whereas IVUS and OCT define anatomy and decide how a lesion can be treated. It can evaluate the anatomic results of PCI and also detect thrombus, culprit lesions, and late stent assessments. Thank you.